Good morning. I'm pleased to present this talk on paravalvular leak assessment. Here are my disclosures. The objectives for this talk are to review the assessment of paravalvular leaks with a focus on the aortic and mitral valves. I'm also going to present some cases demonstrating the procedural use of 3D echocardiography. For more details, I'm going to direct you to the published American as well as the European guidelines. Uh, they provide guidance for both surgical as well as percutaneous uh, prosthetic valve assessments. Prosthetic uh, paravalvular leaks are actually quite common. The instance ranges between 5 to 17 percent in the literature. The instance is actually higher for valves placed in the mitral position with a, a published range of between 7 to 32 percent. Uh, for those in the aortic position, uh, it's much lower between 2 to 10 percent. Typically, if you see an early paravalvular leak, it's due to technical issues or from infection. If you see a late paravalvular leak, it's usually from infection or annular calcification. Prosthetic valves typically need to be assessed in a systematic manner. For the mitral valve, this requires an interrogation of the valve in 30 degree increments from 0 to about 180 degrees. Images should be examined carefully to identify the origin of any um, leaks and to, deter deter to determine whether or not it's within the valve or external to the valve. Additionally, at certain views, such as at the 120 degree views, we typically do sweeps in order to not to miss any paravalvular leaks. If you look at this series of images, this is a mitral mechanical mitral valve. All the leaks are accounted for, and so there is no paravalvular leak in this case. For the aortic valve, we typically start in the transgastric views, and then we map similarly in um, 30 to 40 degree increments in order to see the aortic valve in the long axis as well as the short. For both the mitral and aortic valves, you want to be able to see the leaflets uh, for mechanical valves in parallel so that you can ensure that they're opening and closing properly. The transgastric views are particularly valuable for aortic valve as there can be shadowing of the anterior annulus um, in the mid-esophageal views, and so jets in that area may not be seen. Again, we try and do sweeps in order to make sure that the entire annulus is visualized and all jets are accounted for. Once we've gone in the transgastric views for aortic valves, we come up to the mesophageal. And here you can see examples demonstrating why the posterior annulus is well seen on transesophageal echocardiograms versus on transthoracic. This area tends to be shadowed with mechanical aortic valves. In contrast to surface studies, on transesophageal echocardiograms, the anterior annulus of the aortic valve is heavily shadowed and difficult to see. In the mid-esophageal views, typically we sweep from side to side or up and down from the LVOT up to the aorta in order to ensure that all jets are identified. For the mitral valve, 3D echocardiography has been particularly useful for identifying um, jets. So here we can see a color and non-color 3D uh, on fast view of, the, of a bioprosthetic mitral valve and you can see the location of a large jet. There are some newer techniques that are being uh, shown to be very helpful for assessing paravalvular leaks, especially with the mitral valve. There is the development of this glass technique where the tissues are made more transparent. This allows you to find the origin of the jets and as well as the location of the ring and see if it is um, valvular or paravalvular. One technique that I find particularly useful is looking at the ventricular aspects of the valve with and without color. So here I have a bioprosthetic mitral valve, and as you can see on the leftmost image, there are multiple jets going in multiple directions from this valve, and the question is whether or not there's a paravalvular leak. So in the second image from the left, I've looking at the valve instead of from the atrial side, from the ventricular side. This allows me to see the pieza of any large jets. Now smaller jets may not be seen, or smaller pieces may not be seen, if the um, uh, volume rate is actually very low or if you filtered up too much your 3D data set. So here we actually don't see any color coming from around the sewing ring and you can see the struts very clearly as well as the sewing ring. The other thing is if we take this um, on a glass mode and we turn it on 
And then if you look at the third image from the left, you can see that we've tilted it. So we're looking at the ventricular side at the um, side aspect. And you can see that the jet is coming from within the sewing ring and not outside of it, especially since you can see the relationship of the jet to the struts. On the rightmost image, we're now back in the left atrial view, and we're on a glass view, and we've tilted, and you can see how it can be uh, very um, difficult to know. However, with this view, you can actually slow down the jet, and you can see it as it comes, and the origin where it comes on um, from the valve. Now, we know from a lot of studies that the location of mitral paravalvular leaks tend to be posteriorly, and this is for several reasons. First, because it's distal location in the surgical field. Second, because of the course of the circumflex in that area, surgeons tend to take a shallower bite to try and protect the circumflex artery. And another reason is because there's an increased prevalence of calcium fibrosis in this area, and that makes it difficult to sew the valve annulus into that region. Finally, the anterior portion of the annulus has the mitral fibrosa, which is very rigid and can tether the valve, putting an increase in pressure on this posterior part of the valve. Aortic paravalvular leaks, on the other hand, tend to be more commonly located along the, quote, sort of non-coronary or right coronary cusps as you can see on these examples here. Now, once you've identified your leak, how do you know how to describe it? And especially when you've got a case where there are multiple leaks. So we know that up to 27% of patients may have more than one leak present. A couple of methods have been used for the mitral valve. First, some have taken the Carpentier mitral valve classification and tried to extrapolate it to a prostatic valve. However, the problem with prostatic valves is there's no natural landmarks as there are on a native valve to allow you to identify the scalps. And so there could be huge variability between individuals in terms of reporting where the location of the, uh, the leak is located. Others have tried breaking the, um, the valve into quadrants. And you'll still see some um, readers reporting uh, valve leakages in this matter. And broken down into a, an anterior, a septal, a posterior, as well as the lateral quadrant. However, these quadrants are quite big. And so if you look at the posterior quadrant, there's a jet there, but it's closer to the location of the septal wall than it is the posterior wall. And so that lack of precision can make it challenging to direct your interventionalist when you're communicating with them. So the most common way uh, that uh, paravalvular leak location is communicated is using this clock system. Now this clock system was first uh, re suggested uh, in this initial paper. However, if you look at this initial paper, you'll notice that the 11 o'clock position is actually where the aortic valve um, is located. And then this results in a four chamber view where you have the 12 and 6 o'clock uh, positions noted, a two chamber view with the 3 and 9 o'clock positions noted, and a three chamber view where the 5 and 11 o'clock positions are noted. However, as this clock system has been integrated into guidelines, the 12 o'clock position has actually rotated and now it is located mainly at the uh, location of the aortic valve. The clock system is also used for reporting aortic paravalvular leak uh, positions, except in this case, the RVOT is where the 12 o'clock is located, the PA is where the 3 o'clock is located, the left atrium is where the 6 o'clock would be located, and the right atrium where the 9 o'clock position would be located. Once you've located your paravalvular leak, you also have to provide an idea of the size and the shape. We know from many of these 3D studies that often the shape of the paravalvular leaks may be very eccentric, and so often they're crescentic in nature, and the path through uh, from the left atrium to the ventricle can be very serpiginous. Sometimes the paravalvular leaks can actually come with quite complicated anatomy. Here we see this is a, a repaired aortic root in a patient who had infective endocarditis. And you see there's dehiscence of the reconstructed root posteriorly. There's a leak anteriorly as well as um, from the dehiscence segment, segments. In this case, you just have to first describe the dehiscences followed by the locations of the leak and then an assessment of the uh, size as much as possible. Now, quantification of the severity of the regurgitation in uh, paravalvular leaks is very similar to that used for native leaks, except the only addition is the assessment of the circumferential extent of the leak. And the numbers you have to remember for the mitral valve is 10% and 30%. 
If the circumferential extent of the leak is less than 10%, then it's a mild leak. If it's greater than 30%, then it's severe. However, one of the things about this circumferential um, cutoff is that it doesn't take into uh, account the depth of the leak. So you can have something that's less than 10%, but if it measures 10, 10 millimeters in size, then that's still probably going to be a severe leak uh, rather than mild. Similarly, the aortic uh, assessment of aortic paravalvular leak severity is reliant on, on assessment um, criteria from native aortic valvular regurgitation, except for the addition of the circumferential assessment. Once again, the cutoff values are similar, 10% and 30% with less than 10% being mild and more than 30% being severe. Uh, with the advent of TAVR valves, we generally um, find it very difficult to uh, add up all these circumferential lesions as there may be multiple discrete jets and that makes it more challenging in those valves. We have a lot of percutaneous options now for paravalvular leaks, and so many patients, instead of going straight for surgery, are undergoing percutaneous procedures. Here is an example of a mechanical valve with a percutaneous device in place. On the right, you can see there's a series of different percutaneous devices um, uh, demonstrated. Um, 3D echocardiography, uh, in addition to assessing severity and location of the valves, paravalve leaks is useful for guiding procedures. Here we see on the left guidance of the transeptal puncture, and then on the top right you can see the catheter uh, with the wire going through the paravalvular leak, which is located anteriorly in this mitral valve, and then you have an off-axis view showing the path of the wire from the septum through the valve into the ventricle. Most um, places are slowly integrating this new fusion technology, which allows you to fuse the uh, trans uh, transesophageal echo images to the fluoro. Um, here's an earlier version of that, where a mark is placed on the transesophageal image of, where, of the location of the paravalve leak, and this mark then shows up on the fluoroscopic uh, picture that the interventionalist sees. Echocardiography is very important also for procedural complications during these paravalvular procedures. Here is a um, mechanical mitral valve and you can see there's a catheter coming across the septum and going into the device and then you can see there's one device already placed and then there's the catheter and then on the image on the left you can see that the two discs are moving nicely and they're opening very wide and parallel when they're open and then on the second image to the uh, right, you can see that one of the list, uh, discs is now fixed and not moving at all, and the other disc has restricted motion. Other complications that can be seen on um, echocardiography include device embolization as well as movement once the device has been released. Overall, while this uh, talk is mostly focused on the use of transesophageal echocardiography, transthoracic, as well as other um, imaging modalities such as cardiac CT and cardiac MRI play an important role in assessment of paravalvular leaks. Now I'm going to demonstrate some cases. This is a 77-year-old female who has a history of rheumatic mitral valve disease. She had a tissue mitral valve replacement in 2009. She presents in April of 2019 with severe uh, prosthetic valvular and paravalvular regurgitation. Now, if you look at the top two images, you see that there is a uh, bioprosthetic mitral valve. The top left has no color. The top right um, has color and can appreciate the valvular regurgitation jet that's directed uh, anterolaterally. Now, when we take this image and we rotate it and we're off axis, now we can actually appreciate both the valvular as well as the power valvular leak. So this patient ended up having a valve and valve procedure to treat the a valvular leak, and this is after that um, valve and valve procedure. And so you can see that there's a nice um, new valvoprostatic valve in the mitral valve position, and now we can actually truly appreciate the size of the paravalvular leak. So the top uh, two images with and without color show uh, the location of that paravalvular leak, 
And then on the leftmost image, you can see that we've rotated it to an, um, a non-on-fast plane so we can actually see the whole. And then there are two images on the bottom that are taking the 3D data sets, and one is with color and one is without color, where we've actually moved the planes so that we are cutting through the leak. And you can see that's a very crescentic shape, and this allows us to get a measurement and eventually plan to place a device there. Now let's look at this other case. This is an 80-year-old gentleman with a bioprosthetic mitral valve replaced in 1983. Then he had a redo of valve surgery in 1997 with a mechanical valve. And then he required a third redo operation um, in 2013 and was given a tissue valve at that point. He was um, found to have a pair of leak. Due to his multiple surgeries, he was not um, offered another surgical option, but underwent a percutaneous procedure in 2017. And on the pictures on the right at the top and bottom, you can see at the 11 o'clock position, there is one of the devices that was placed. However, he still was left with um, some pair of leaks. You can see there's one right next to the original device at 11 o'clock, and there's a second smaller leak at about uh, 5 o'clock, um, or located posteriorly. So because he returned with anemia caused uh, from the hemolysis that required transfusion, he underwent another procedure. So here's a series of images showing his procedure. So on the top left images, you can see there's a color and non-color image showing the catheter and the wire as we are crossing next to the original device with a wire. You can see that the wire has gone through on the middle image and, and the device is still in place. Then on the top rightmost image, you see a color and non-color showing the, uh, that two devices are now there at the 11 o'clock position. There is still residual jet coming from between the two devices, but it's not as significant as it was before. If you look at the bottom row of fluoroscopic images, you can see the matching images that were taken at the same time as the TEE, and with the leftmost fluoroscopic image showing the wire crossing the paravalvula leak and then the middle image showing the deployment of the second device next to the original device, and then the final rightmost image showing um, the two devices in place after they've been released. So in summary, paravalvular leak assessment includes identification of a note number, location, size, shape, and regurgitation severity. For the um, mitral as well as the aortic valves, you have to look at both the uh, mid-esophageal for the mitral valve and the transgastrics for the esophageal. You need to use a standard um, uh, systematic way to uh, increase your angle as you assess, as well as doing sweeps to ensure that you're not missing any um, any uh, leaks. 3D echocardiography is very helpful for uh, location as well as sizing of these uh, leaks. It's also useful for percutaneous device placement and ass assessment of complications and residual regurgitation. I'd like to acknowledge the structural program in uh, obtaining some of these images. Um, thank you for listening.